Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Mike Mattesino speaking to you from Burbank, California. And um, we have gathered a little group together to celebrate the life and career of Maestro Ennio Morricone, one of the most prolific and influential composers of film music that we have ever seen. Um, sadly, he passed away um, just about exactly a month ago. And um, coincidentally, we had just come out with a 50th anniversary edition of his score for the 1970 film Two Mules for Sister Sarah, uh, which was uh, produced with um, some of the friends and colleagues who have uh, joined me today. Uh, there's uh, Michael Gerhard of La La Land Records and his partner, Matt Burboys. And from Universal Studios, the director of music publishing and the person who runs our film music heritage collection, Alexia Baum and the uh, very distinguished and um, commentator, historian, teacher, journalist, author of, on the subject of film music is with us, author of the liner notes for the release, Mr. John Burlingame. And that takes care of the California contingent and uh, also speaking to us from Europe, we have the head of Quartet Records, uh, Senor Jose Benitez coming to us from Spain um, who has put out a number of um, scores um, by Morricone, one of which was uh, State of Grace, which I believe we did together. And we also have recently done a lot of other projects with Universal. And in uh, Milano, Italy, um, Mar Maurizio Caschetto, uh, who is also a very uh, noted uh, commentator on the subject of film music and uh, being based in Italy, he I'm sure has some insight to give us um, from being over there. And I think that uh, generally speaking, um, what this says, just in broad terms about what we're doing today, is the power that music has to bring us together. And, um, you know, you're looking at it. And specifically with film music, it just fires our imagination. It takes us to places um, that uh, we normally can't go. That's a, an especially profound thing for me right now, where we're all basically mm -hmm. at home. Um, but also when you have a composer who has achieved the true greatness that Morricone has, what this says is that we will always talk about him, his music will always be heard. And therefore, people who achieve uh, that kind of an influence um, are never really gone. There's always a piece of them still around. Um, and that's something to um, celebrate, even though we mourn the loss of him in person. Um, I'd like to start with uh, John Burlingame um, to just give us, um, tell us something about who Ennio was and um, what was his career track and what were some of the milestones and how he got to be who he was. The timing, of course, uh, on this release couldn't have been, I think, more special. Um, I, I know that La La Land had been planning to do a 50th anniversary uh, edition of Two Mules for Sister Sarah, uh, and it had been in the works for quite some time. <clears throat> When, uh, when we lost the maestro. Um, and so I think this is, it's a great reminder, uh, not only of his sort of classic Western scores and the kind of colorful writing that he was renowned for, but uh, also a, remi a reminder to us of how uh, unique his voice was in film music. He was a trumpeter who uh, then, then studied in Italy in the late 1940s and into the early 1950s. And, found that um, like so many composers, gr uh, great classically trained composers of the time, couldn't really make a living doing that kind of music. So inevitably by the mid 1950s, he was um, doing pop arrangers, doing pop arrangements for, for singers in Italy um, and very clever, very uh, unique pop arrangements. And it's that, uh, it's that, unusual voice of his that got him noticed and eventually led to his first film in 1961, Il Federale, The Fascist. Um, but what, what I find interesting is that he was so prolific, as we all here know, in the 1960s, and yet by the time he did Two Meals for Sister Sarah, which came out in 1970, he still was not very well known in the United States. He'd had the one big hit, of course, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, which, um, which we saw here in 19... 66, 67, and which uh, um, in Hugo Montenegro's cover version actually landed a top hit, top 10 hit. But 
Morricone was, because of that, if anybody knew his name at that point, um, it was pretty much thought of as a kind of one-off, this sort of weird, fun, colorful Western theme for a sort of big Clint Eastwood Western hit. Um, the reality was that he had, in that period of time, that 1961 to 1970 period, worked on dramas and comedies and science fiction and fantasy. Um, and Westerns were, and in fact, if you spoke with the maestro, you know, God help you if you began to use phrases like spaghetti Westerns. He was <laughs> not happy about that term. Uh, and, and also I think kind of resented the fact that here in America, we thought of him as this sort of strange offbeat Western composer. If you try to tell a composer today that in that period of time between about 1967 and about 1971, that Ennio Morricone was composing anywhere from 16 to 20 scores per year. That's an unbelievable quantity of music, particularly when you consider he orchestrated every note, meaning he literally wrote down every note that was to be played by every person in the orchestra, um, which is something that almost no one does even today. Embarrassed to say this, I have listened to virtually every one of those scores <laughs> over the years. They're all unique. They're all different. They all have something very special. It's one great melody after another. Well, I'd like to get, um, uh, in all humility, a little bit of um, conversation about the fact that he came from Italy. Um, today, I put a Tuscany Valley background so that not only my name um, was Italian, <laughs> but one of um, Maurizio, who's actually over there, um, and I've always felt that just as um, most of the composers of the great operas were Italian, that the, even though opera itself covers many, many stories, biblical, you know, taking place in other places, there's something that the Italian spirit brings to music. And I've always kind of felt that um, as much as we love all of our American composers and who have backgrounds from other parts of Europe, there was just a, a unique voice that um, uh, cinema was affected in the same way as opera was by virtue of this sort of Italian spirit. Um, Maurizio, uh, could you uh, speak to that point and, and maybe um, how you discovered his music and what some of your favorites are? I think th what you said is very interesting to me because I was actually thinking about uh, how could I put uh, Ennio Morricone's Italian roots uh, a little bit to explain to, to all of you, because I think they are absolutely essential to understand fully his incredible musical personality, uh, at, at least in my opinion. Um, after a few days after he passed away, I was talking with a dear friend of mine here in Italy about uh, what his music meant for, for both of us. And this friend of mine made an apt observation about how much of his music is a, really a pure Italian spirit. And you can find it virtually in all, all of his music and all of his uh, scores for films. So I think Morricone was a genius in mixing the sacred and the profane in many ways, so to speak. Uh, in the same scores, you can find, you know, the utmost, most lyrical, even pious music, uh, followed by something very uh, out of the left field, uh, like a strange noise from the real life, or a nasal sound, or someone whistling, or something like that. So this kind of duality, I think, can be seen as something very Italian, at least from my point of view, as the ability, but also the limit, to never take ourselves too seriously, in a way. So to be religious and sacrilegious at the same time. So uh, solemnity was always counterbalanced by irony or joke, so quite a lot of his music for film contains this kind of duality, in my opinion. As for my own favorite scores, well, the list is very long. I can go a little bit autobiographical here by saying that the first score um, I discovered from Maestro Morricone was uh, The Mission, because uh, one of my brothers, one day it was, I think the late eighties, brought home the, the old LP record of The Mission. Uh, by that time, I was very little. I was kind of 10, 11 years old. I was already kind of obsessed with film music, mainly by John Williams. But uh, Morricone's music was 
virtually everywhere here in Italy because in our local Italian television channels in those years, a lot of his movies were airing, uh, especially the, the Sergio Leone movies, but he was also doing a lot of uh, work for television in those years for uh, TV series or made for TV movies like La Piovra or Marco Polo or I Promessi Sposi. And I remember watching some of those series, even if I was very little and noticing the music. But the mission was very, very special for me because it opened up a new dimension of, of music. Uh, even though I was very already very excited by uh, the American side of film music, mainly by John Williams or Alan Silvestri or Jerry Goldsmith, uh, Morricone's music opened up a, a new dimension for me. And from that moment on, growing up, of course, I started to, you know, to become more and more aware about his incredible output and discovering more and more of his scores. So I think I fell in, in love with many of his, of his uh, scores. So, and in the end, I think he became one of my top five film composers uh, of all time in my own personal ranking. Jose, uh, how did you discover Ennio's music? My first contact with Morricone's music uh, came when I was a child. Uh, in fact, um, unlike most people of my generation, my initial encounter with film music uh, was not John Williams or Star Wars or Superman, but uh, Henry Mancini and the music for the Pink Panther cartoons and John Barry and the James Bond films. Uh, I don't remember when, but almost at the same time, uh, at eight or nine, uh, I found uh, uh, that my father had a cassette with a compilation of Morricone's Western. I held it and it was an immediate shock. Um, I, I had the music in my head uh, before I saw the films, which were very violent, so my parents uh, would not let me see them. Um, for a long time, Morricone was the, the, the composer on, on the Western in, in, in my head. In fact, uh, it took me a long time to identify the Western sound, which is an absolute American genre, with Bernstein, Moros, and others who are the absolute fathers of, of music for Westerns. Um, then the music of, of uh, John Williams, Jeffrey Goldsmith, James Horner, Maurice Jarre, and others uh, came into my life. And Morigone, somewhat forgotten in the best discovery of, of that is film music. Everything changed again when I saw Cinema Paradiso, a film whose music changed my life again. I, I had a, a huge curiosity to, to listen to the erotic films of the 70s or the giallos of by Morricone. This also opened me to the world of the, of the Italian composers in, in general, which is a, a parallel universe in, in itself. Well, I'd like to jump on that parallel universe, which was a terrific way of stating it and share my experience. Um, my father loved Westerns, and I remember as a small boy sitting and watching all of them on television with him, but they were basically all of the John Wayne slash studio American made variety. So I was therefore exposed to um, the uh, Dimitri Tiomkin and uh, Victor Young and Bernard Herrmann, and even some of the Jerry Goldsmith Western scores. Um, and then there were some of these ones that um, Ennio scored would often show on Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon television, and I would catch them my own on my own. And I remember the specific one was Once Upon a Time in the West, which um, it just I just was intrigued by the title and turned it on and watched it. And I was by myself, very, very young. And I was absolutely transfixed by it. And I think if we could go back in time and see what television actually looked like in the 1970s, we'd be appalled and think we were going blind. But somehow, even then, I was just so just captivated by the visual scope of it, but absolutely by the music. I was just riveted to it. And um, it was so different 
from what all the other Western scores I'd been exposed to were like. And of course, at that age, I couldn't really articulate what was going on. But um, later, as I watched more of them and started to really study film music and get more involved in it, I just, I, th I, th I think I would best state it that there's some way that he hits the psychological undercurrent of what's going on. Um, and that it maybe like fires a different part of the brain that the other scores didn't quite do or did in a different way. And um, I think it's more of an emotional than psychological. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I th now you could say that all film composers do that. They have to find, you know, sort of the undercurrent of what the, what's really going on and, yes. and score that rather than just kind of push the action along. But of course, that's an essential part of it as well. But there was always something where um, Morricone would seem to be um, looking at it from a wider perspective. And as you say, the emotional and psychological undertones of the story were always somehow addressed. And he just, I don't think he tried to do that. This was just his gift. When we got to the mid eighties and um, he really sort of became very, very well known in the American mainstream when we had uh, Once Upon a Time in America and um, The Mission and The Untouchables. Um, you know, it, that was very, very clear to me. And then one of the ones that we worked on at La La Land was Fat Man and Little Boy, which was not a successful movie and is usually not mentioned um, in his filmography. But there, where we're talking about um, the project to make the first atom bombs. I loved working on that score. It just had that hypnotic effect on me because it was almost like he was writing a score from, that addressed kind of the moral and ethical dilemma that they were facing. The score of that movie does a better job of what the movie wanted to do as the film. I, I find that all the sort of uh, commentary and emotion tied to the atomic age is in the, is in the music. There's good stuff in the film and nice performances, but but Ennio just, you know, nails the complexity of, of that issue and makes it beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I think we've said this before where the film is not that great. Somehow the composer scores the, scores the movie the filmmakers wish they'd have made. But, <laughs> um, but, but with Ennio, it always just seemed that the, the depth of thought, um, you know, and um, psychological underpinnings came through in the music, whether or not the surface narrative of the movie was entirely successful or not. Even when it was, of course, it just made for a better movie. I think that Two Mules is certainly an example of that also. There's just it's such not a... Dis it's not dissimilar with his score for The Thing, where it's this crazy, d disturbing sounding sci-fi music, but yet incredibly sophisticated, sort of hypnotic. I, I find the score just way more interesting than the film nothing against the film um but yeah like you just said mike i think that sometimes he probably got at some deeper element just instinctively in some of these films that he was working with and that's certainly what caught my attention before i even knew who he was before i was in the great position to be able to work with so many composers you know including many of the greats of the last century vis-a-vis -vis the universal pictures catalog um but I have to say Morricone's probably remained the top of my list. Do you have an oh wow score when you first discovered him? I grew up, you know, in, in the 70s in a house with very little uh, TV. We had the rabbit ear TV, which my mom would throw out every few months, but we had constant music. Uh, my stepdad had been a jazz musician in New Orleans, and we were listening to Train and Ella and Miriam McCabe and all this stuff. So I was very used to hearing different music. And I remember uh, my brother at one point was watching TV and there were people getting killed and flying all over the screen, which I've never been able to watch. It was probably Fistful of Dollars, The Good, Bad, Bad and the Ugly. And I remember turning away and I heard the sound and I literally stopped in my tracks. I was just thinking about this this morning. I, like it, I remembered this. I literally stopped in my tracks and spun around and I'm like, what is that? It was Enyo freaking Mor Morricone. <laughs> the sound was so unusual and distinctive, and in my mind, my child's mind, it didn't match what I was seeing, but in the best possible way. And I was like, what is that? I want to know what that is. That is the most interesting thing I've heard. And I pretty much probably forgot about it for you know a decade or two. 
And then, you know, when I came into this position with Universal, um, this particular score, Two Mules, um, kind of unwittingly was the impetus for the Heritage Collection. Um, some of you know this story. Um, Tarantino was working, I think it was Django Unchained at that point, and his music supervisor, who I've known for years, who's worked with Quentin for years, uh, she called up and said, hey, I want to get, a, you know, Quentin wants to use a few from Two Mules for Sister Sarah. And at first, I didn't even realize it was ours, because like probably a lot of studios, we don't actually have on hand all of the music we own, you know, because of the how old the studio is and everything. Um, but I thought, you know, I got to be in my bonnet about it. I'm like, oh my God, that's Morricone. Wouldn't that be amazing? So I dug in. We had it. We're, I'm like, pull the tapes, pull the tapes. They did it. We transferred it. Long story short, the cue, the particular cue, ended up being in the film, which what it let me do was have the leverage to say, hey, we made X number of dollars on this studio. How about if we keep doing this? How about if we make it a thing? We call it audio preservation, which is a legitimate desire that fortunately the studio and Mike Knobloch and Eric Cullen have all supported. Um, and I was just hooked. Frankly, it's the best thing about my job in my humble opinion is to get to dig up. I mean, last year we got to do, you know, Bride of Frankenstein with the La La Land team and Mike, but this Morricone score is so special to me, not only because I find it exquisitely humorous and sophisticated and kind of heartbreaking in some places, but it's so surprising. He's so unique and surprising. Who would have thought that you would hear that sound, that melodic mule sound, which I can't get out of my head now, since I've been listening to the score for days. I just find him to be uh, a stunning talent, and I'm so grateful that we, A, found the score, were able to work with all of you guys, and then really, because of him, in a way, start this whole project, which still continues. And this one has been, Two Mules has been on my drawing board for two plus years. It was the first one we wanted to do. And for a whole host of reasons, it took this long, but I'm just so proud of um, the fact that it's finally out and that it sounds amazing. And yeah, Morricone is, is still, still the main guy for me. Well, you know, yeah. Mike, Mike, one of the things that we, we haven't, one of the words I think that we haven't yet talked about here is boldness. One of the things that I think identifies a Morricone score, and he's always done this, and, I, and in fact, it's gotten him in trouble with some filmmakers, is that he has a boldness in terms of his conception and his execution. If he comes up with an idea, and, and one of the things that I think, and I think we probably all love Ennio Morricone for, is that his music not only elevates the film in terms of uh, what, what, he, what he adds to it in terms of depth and exploration of, of emotion and, um, and, drum, and simply drama, but he becomes a full partner in the storytelling. He brings music to the fore in ways that very few composers in the history of film music have been, al have been allowed to do. He, and I think that it may have something to do with the fact that the European sensibility of filmmaking has very often been different than the sort of director-centric, uh, auteurist kind of attitude that's been going on in America for a long time, um, which is that the writing, the directing, the acting, the cinematography, all these things are important, but so is the music. It's not just an evil of post-production the way an awful lot of directors somehow Im imagine it to be. But Ennio was always bold when he came up with a concept. Uh, oh. I, 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 and I think Two Mules is an example of this. Certainly Good, good the Bad, the Ugly is this. The Mission is this. All of these, um, if you hire Ennio Morricone, you're going to get a bold thinking composer. I was gonna say, even uh, in something like The Mission, which was a life changer for me when I saw that film on the big screen, and heard the score, that's when I sort of came full circle and I'm like, oh my God, it's that same guy, Ennio Morricone. I have to know about this. I was just obsessed with that score and the fact that he included sort of more organic tribal drum sounds, it, it wasn't just straight orchestral, although obviously the orchestral parts were magnificent and so beautiful. But I just thought, this guy's unique and I just, no one else sort of 
could compare in my reaction to hearing his scores to him. I mean, there's so many great talents these days, the, you know, Alexandre Desplat and, you know, some of the many composers you guys have mentioned, John Barry, of course, John Williams, um, but Morricone kind of, in my mind, is on his own separate shelf because he was so bold and, and original. He's what, absolutely original. What's so great about Morricone is that he transcends film music, that he has been able to influence rock and, and hip hop and country. I mean, if you go and you listen to a lot of music in the last 20 years or so, there's just samples of his work that pop up in a bunch of songs that are exposed to a whole new generation of uh, of fans out there and uh, you know that aren't familiar with his works for the last 50 odd years and that's what uh, makes him so unique uh, in the world of film composing and just just the music in general well Michael um, and then Matt you know I don't nobody that has a soundtrack label um, does it without loving film music beforehand <laughs> so um, we're the, you know and then then you get to be in the position of actually putting some of these things out yeah. so um, you know, where does that sit with the history of La La Land Records in terms of your own interest in Morricone's music and then in the desire to actually have um, some of his works uh, on your label? For me, Morricone came into my life at a very early age. Uh, my mother was a big fan of Clint Eastwood films. So I was exposed to spaghetti Western stuff when I was very young. I remember we had eight tracks and we had four soundtracks. We had Grease, we had Superman, we had Star Wars and we had, I believe it was Good, the Bad and the Ugly or maybe it was a compilation, I can't remember entirely. So uh, I was kind of growing up with that kind of music at a very young age uh, and watching the movies too. Uh, my parents were very cool about me watching anything I wanted. I remember seeing the thing on beta, I think at home, summer of 83 maybe, summer of 84 when we rented a beta machine and. Yeah, and 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 watch the uh, watch the thing. Uh, so, but you know, his his music to me, along with Williams, has just been a part of my life at a very young age. And uh, as I got older and discovered his more romantic side, his you know the giallos that he did, the, the 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 cop music, like like the Italian action cop films. I mean, that stuff is just so crazy. Uh, you know, but but you know, to me. He, he hit his peak with, uh, my personal opinion, with Legend of 1900. Um, I think it's one of the most magnificent scores, uh, not only in his catalog, but ever done. It's uh, just so beautiful and heartbreaking. And I thought a lot of what was conveyed in the story and the character uh, was conveyed through Ennio's music, because I think he can actually relate to this character, uh, because this character in the film is just, he's just, pure music. And I, th I think that's what makes some of that score so, um, so personal, uh, particularly the, the track Playing Love. Uh, it's still one of my favorite pieces of music of all time. And you know, if you've never heard it, seek it out. Uh, watch the clip. It's, it's just one of the most ideal moments of, of music set to film. You know, for me, Growing up in the in the seventies into the eighties, the spaghetti westerns were in the uh, oh, sorry sorry Ennio, uh, but uh, that that music was in the zeitgeist. So I was aware of it. I think like most people generally were. You know, my dad would see sometimes that westerns would be on TV. Um, for me personally, my my personal connection with Morricone was going to see The Untouchables as a teenager. Uh, I can remember only one, one other time in my life being a little kid watching Star Wars where a title sequence just felt life-changing to me. And that main title starts, that main credit sequence, the opening titles, and I'm on the edge of my seat like a minute in, and it doesn't sound like the past. It doesn't sound like the future. It barely sounds like the present. But it's incredible. I'm on the edge of my seat, and you could have shown me a test pattern after after that track. And I, you know, so fortunate that the rest of the score is great and the movie's good too. Um, but that's what opened the doors for me, and I made those connections back to the westerns. And as I became more film obsessed, I probably my favorite Morricone score, and it, 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 it changes. Uh, but it's the two onces with a tip towards Once Upon a Time in the West. I just find you listen to that and you don't even need to see the film, quite frankly, as much as I love both films. 
um, the whole story's there and you want to, uh, you want to cry, you want to love, you want to avenge all in the same, <laughs> all, all those emotions. And it just, just, um, he was just so incredibly unique, you know, um, what can you say? No, I think what we were you saying actually, and what John was saying before about the boldness speaks a lot about uh, his ability to be surprising and always against the expectations. Every choice is the consequence of a long process of meditation and decision. And his discipline, of course, is something that he was known for. And this is something, in my opinion, that uh, put him close uh, to John Williams in a way, because they both adhere to, for their entire career, uh, to a, an ideal of excellence throughout a strict and almost monk-like discipline, writing something every day, taking care of all the notes, thinking deeply about uh, the whole process, even when they are viscerally reacting to, to what they are seeing. So despite this apparent ease of writing, you know, incredible, flowing, timeless melodies, uh, Morricone often spoke about how difficult that was for him, you know, and how much that was the result of a very long process about, you know, analyzing intervals and melodic contour and so on. So he often said that one of the primary targets of the film composer uh, is to be understood by the audience. So I think this is very important. And this is something that speak volumes about how the level of care he put into everything he, he, he did. Jose, can I ask you if you go to the opposite side of the spectrum on this about some of the um, more lesser known um, scores that you have put out on your label and if there are any stories about finding them, rescuing them and actually um, getting them out there for all of us. Uh, Windows, uh, which is an almost unknown and obscure film directed by Gordon Willis, the cinematographer of The Godfather, and other classics. Uh, it's a psychological thriller that uh, hardly anyone has seen. I managed to see it on video and I realized that the film has only 10 or 12 minutes of music which had never been here before. Not uh, even a cue in a compilation. Uh, so I asked it to the studio, uh, which was MGM, uh, they don't have any element uh, beyond the, the mono stem, which uh, was uh, not very suitable due to the low amount of the score in, in the film, 10 minutes or so. Um, but uh, we discovered that the score had been recorded in New York instead of Italy, where Morricone usually recorded. And we locate the multi tracks there. Um, and uh, remember that uh, we managed to ship these multi tracks to LA and we transferred the tapes. And we found a, a wonderful, bittersweet score, a, a classic Morricone with great influence from other scores of the, of the period, uh, such as White Dog, for example and sounds that he will later use in films like Baxi or Crossing the Line or the Almodovar Spanish film, Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down. Um, there were almost 50 minutes of mu music uh, uh, he brought for the, fi for the film, uh, my, most of it uh, in used uh, finally in the, in the final cut of the film. Um, another album that I am very proud is uh, State of Grace, a film that uh, I l really loved so much. It's, uh, uh, it was a very unappreciated in its release, but now it's a cold film with Sean Penn, Robin Wright, Gary Oldman. Uh, this album was uh, produced and uh, remixed by Mr. Mike Matesino. Um, and as usual in many Morricone scores, the mix of the film is uh, totally different from what he prepared for the album. So we kept both an, on a double CD. Um, in the score uh, prepared for the film, um, I remember that Mike 
found many wonderful cues that were not on the on the album um, nor used in, in the film. Uh, in the same style is also Sahara, uh, the canon the canon movie with the Brooke Shields. The music is really wonderful. In fact, I think any Morricone score for a film that uh, takes place in the desert is stunning. The <laughs> desert <laughs> really inspired him. Uh, there was a lot of music in the film that wasn't on the album, and the album featured differently edited on mixes cues, even specifically recorded. So we put the two together on a, on a double CD, uh, which was mastered by Daniel Winkler, a great expert and pre-visionist pre in the world of Morricone. You touched on something there, which is about the fact that every time I've encountered any of the recordings, we always find that he has specifically remixed the albums and that they're invariably different from what you hear. Yeah. Two Mules being no exception, which is why it was yeah. uh, a, a two disc set, because the mixes are all entirely different. <laughs> um, and he also yeah. had, a, I guess, a unique group of people and places that he worked with when he recorded <laughs> in Italy. So maybe John and Maurizio, do you have anything that you can um, illuminate about that? I think he had uh, some favorite places where he, he recorded the scores in Italy. There was the, the Forum Studio Music uh, Village in, in Rome, in the, the center of the city, which was basically where he recorded a lot of these scores during throughout the 80s and the 90s, and mostly also to, during the 2000s. But I think the 60s, I think he was mainly doing stuff at RCA, the Italian uh, studios of RCA. So uh, that, that, that is, I think, the, the two places that he uh, were, were his favorite uh, places where to record his scores. And I always noticed, uh, I don't know how many scores exactly he recorded outside Italy. In fact, that was one of my questions for you, uh, Mike, uh, about how many scores he recorded in the US, for example. I think in my mind, I can think only of uh, four or five, but probably there are more, right? John, I think you would know more than I would about that. Well, I don't know. I, I do think there's probably more than four or five, but I would doubt that if it was it was more than a dozen. Uh, mm -hmm. He really preferred to stay home. He preferred yes. to be in Rome where he was comfortable with his musicians, his choirs. Um, and in, as we know, in the 1960s and 70s, especially, you know, one particular conductor uh, before he began conducting all of his own scores, I guess, in the in the 1970s. Um, but, you know, I understand that. Um, and I know that it frustrated some filmmakers who, uh, and, you know, of course had to, well, one of the things, you know, Mike and I, we talked about this during the, during the writing of the notes for Two Mules, which was, um, when exactly did he record the score? Mm -hmm. And uh, my feeling is it was probably in September of 1969, because I could chart um, the producer's travels through <laughs> stories and variety. <laughs> and when I found out that he had gone to Rome at a certain point in that fall of 1969, and then he came back to the United States, and specifically we knew it was for the recording, I figured, well, that's, that's it. I, I'm sure that they tried to get him here. Right. Because that would have been the appropriate studio protocol at the time. But listen, um, and if you read Don Siegel- uh, has a Stanley Wilson credit on it, isn't that right? That's right, and which I think has confused many people for many years. But the reality is Stanley Wilson at that point, uh, Joel Gershenson having been gone at that by that time, Stanley was essentially in charge of the Universal Music Department. And so he yeah. would have had to go to Italy to more or less represent the studio during the recording process. Um, just because he's credited as music supervisor on the film, doesn't really mean that he actually supervised anything because we do know that when, when, when Morricone was signed to do a score at that point, and let's face it, Siegel loved what he was doing, absolutely adored it, called him a genius. Um, and you don't hear directors using those kinds of, you know, terms about composers most of the time. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think that uh, to come back to your point, I don't think he recorded a lot in America and I think he just preferred to stay in Rome. And, uh, and I think that the uniqueness of those sounds that we all adore and, and revere now is in large measure because he was home. He knew we could, what he could achieve 
within those studio confines with the people that he was familiar with and liked working yes. with. The first score he recorded in, in the USA is Exorcist 2 in the 77. Okay. Seven, uh, Exorcist 2. Uh, later he recorded some scores uh, in the States like Windows, uh, The Thing was recorded in, in, in the States. Um, Wolf was done here. Yes, but not more or five, six. One time in London for the mission and his experience was terrible. The, <laughs> the, the, the British musicians, which are the, the, probably the, the, one of the best in the, in the world. And it was the, the terrible experience with the mission. He always preferred to, to record it in, in Italy with his own musicians. It's more comfortable for, for him. No, I, I was asking because I, recently I talked with several LA studio musicians for, for the other John Williams project I'm doing. And a couple of them told me about recording with Morricone, but none of them re remembered specifically, specifically what movies were. So because the, it was a kind of a long time ago. Uh, so I, that's why I asked to you guys, because I, I, I was fascinated because he didn't speak anything of English. So he had to be, have an interpreter helping him to conduct the orchestra. So I guess it was, that was another obstacle for him that probably uh, made him prefer recording in his own country here in Italy. And let's face it, the wine is so much better in Italy anyways. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> and also, you know, the, the studio system, I mean, obviously a composer ideally has creative control, you know, with vis-a-vis -vis the director and the director's vision of music for the film. But there's something to be said for the physical distance and the familiarity with his own players and the whole milieu of Rome and the food and the wine and the lifestyle. You know, when you get into certainly the more modern day um, studio system, what's left of it, I guess I should say, you know, it it's, feels quite different than maybe it's a romanticized version I have of Morricone in Italy recording these fantastic scores. But I dare say the sound of it, like you can feel that there's something more passionate and unguarded and organic that comes through in it. And I think that's part of those elements are what speak to all of us through all these different generations and all different styles of films that he was able to do. He always had that uniqueness and that ability to cut through in some way. And I, I dare say that I'm imagining that being in that environment only added to that, you know? I've always loved when I get my hands on or ears on um, these recordings to actually go in, microanalyze and hear what's really going on. And then in the decisions that he made for the albums versus the film, it's always just a fascinating, you know, sort of insight into the whole entire process. John, um, as I recall, the album for Once Upon a Time in the West was a huge commercial success. Do you think that played a role in the fact that he was always so hands-on in crafting his albums from that point forward? I think, I think it goes farther back than that. And, and again, this is one of the things that makes um, Ennio's career and his music a little bit, I don't want to say unique, but certainly more unique than a lot of his peers of the time, which is that he had a substantial career in the recording business in the 1950s, even before he started writing film music in 1961. And he is, his understanding of, of what, a, what makes a popular record, um, what works for a singer in terms of backing a singer uh, orchestrally, um, and the kinds of sounds that once passed through that microphone and coming out of the speakers, is different than, let's say, a live orchestral performance. Uh, and I think that uh, that experience um, was applied all the way through his film music career. And so when it comes to making a record versus the mix that he knew would work in, in the speakers of the movie theaters of the world is, as, as we know, is really two different things. So his experience, you know, um, I, I you know, one of my favorite 60s Ennio Morricone discs is Se Telefonando, um, oh. which is what I love. I just, I mean, uh, when I got my hands on that record, I must have played it a thousand times. Um, yeah. and, and so 
he knows what works and what uh, what what kinds of sounds will work better on a record than in a film to sum up one of the uh, things that you do john is awards coverage and i know you and i both got to see ennio and john williams together um the day before the oscars in i think 2009 so over 11 years ago which was a, just a profound moment for me that i'll never forget what was his uh relationship in history with um academy awards <laughs> The whole idea that by the time he got his first Oscar nomination in 1978 for Days of Heaven, he had probably already written 200 scores. Uh, and, and that's not an exaggeration. It's I, I, what it is, yeah. By the time he had written, by the time he had written Two Meals for Sister Sarah, he'd already scored more than 100 films just in that first nine years of his film career. Um, so, and of course, if you look back, I mean, and you know, and this is the the whole hindsight thing with the Oscars is, you know, we all we play that game all the time. Um, how many Oscars should he have had by the time you know he got to Days of Heaven, four or five maybe? Uh, how many did he have? None. Um, and even to the point where, uh, when we we came to the mission, I, I so clearly remember being at home that night watching the Academy Awards in early 1987 and being absolutely convinced that at long last, our favorite maestro was finally going to receive his due from Hollywood with the well-deserved Academy Award for the score for the mission. And he lost. What a shame. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I wanted, to throw, I wanted to throw things through the screen. I thought, how, can, how could the Academy be so foolish? So uh, it's, it's a lack of understanding of this masterpiece going, unnoticed. I, I heard a story uh, a while ago that after he lost, I think it was he and was it Bill Conti that was also nominated that year, went to a bar and basically just got drunk for the rest of the night? <laughs> I don't think that's true. I don't know. <laughs> it's a great story though. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but here, here's the deal. Um, to make a long story short, what happens is it's the music branch that nominates the score. And certainly by 1986, the music branch was well aware of Ennio Morricone and, and fully respectful of, of his artistry. But it is the entire Academy, including actors and production designers and cinematographers and writers uh, and costume designers, et cetera, who vote for the final uh, choices. And the composer's name is not actually even on the ballot. So generally, you know, when you're looking at that ballot and they came across round midnight, everybody thought, oh yeah, remember that jazz movie? It had all that great jazz in it. So people checked that one off instead. And the mission, while successful, was not that well reviewed. And so if it had been a, a runaway blockbuster like, you know, Lawrence of Arabia or Dr. Zhivago, um, it might've been different. But in any case, um, it's, it's to the Academy's credit that in 2006, they voted him the Honorary Academy Award. And I spoke to some of the governors and it was without question, a kind of vote of apology. We should have given this to you in 1987 for the mission. And we're going to make up for it now by giving you an honorary Oscar for your entire body of work, which was, I thought was great. Was, and was finally Clint, accomplished what we needed. Was, was Clint behind that by any chance? Did he help usher into that? Uh... No. It was not. Clint had nothing to do with it. He wound up presenting the Oscar. Oh, okay. In Just fact, present. it was it was in fact the music branch governors who proposed it that year. Oh, okay. As a way of saying it's time, uh, and of course, you know, by 2006 he wasn't getting any younger, and I think the idea was let's reward him now while he's still with us, and of course, then you know, uh, another another um, almost decade later, he winds up with a competitive Oscar for the Tarantino picture, The Hateful Eight. Um, is this fair? Well, maybe not, but at least, at least he was acknowledged, I think, um, in front of a worldwide audience in a way that uh, I think we can all be grateful for. We know that we will always talk about him and hear his music, mm -hmm. that, it, uh, you know, that it has the power to bring us all together as it has with our little group here. So um, maybe uh, we could wrap up unless I've been um, forgetful about something or if anybody has any other thoughts they'd um, like to um, close with. I'd just like to say, you know, just 
thank God for, you know, Universal Heritage and Alexia and her team and with Eric to create an opportunity for, at least for our label, I, I can speak for Michael too. I think the fact that we have a Morricone Western that we were able to uh, release, maybe somebody for the first time is hearing Two Mules and it's, that's worth the whole thing. Yeah, it's, it's been a highlight for me. I've been in music publishing my whole career, 25, 20 something years at this point. And it, it sounds almost corny, but it, it is really genuinely true that that is what gasses up my tank for some of the other tasks of which I'm less passionate. But, you know, every time you open a vault or open a drawer, you're like, oh my God, here's some, oh my gosh, here's another juicy thing we have to be able to preserve and remaster and potentially release. So that has been an absolute pleasure and passion project for me. Long may it rain. You guys have been exquisite partners. I know Jose and Maurizio, you do great work as well. I don't know that I've gotten to work directly with you, but I'm just so glad that there are still markets for this, that things are appreciated, even if sometimes it feels like, you know, a, a cult-like um, fan base. Yeah, I know everybody here, I think, <laughs> likes to feel that they play a role in sort of a higher calling of preserving this material so that it exists um, long after we're all gone. I think the, the work you guys at La La Land and Jose as well are doing is very important. It's a stepping stone into the preserving the legacy. I think what the, the future generation will understand more and more as they will go deeper into the huge repertoire of Ennio Morricone would be that he's a really a multifaceted figure. There are so many aspects, uh, very, very interesting musical sides of his personality. So it's very important to preserve and to give people a platform to, to, to have materials to study for the future and to enjoy also, uh, because it's very, I think he is one of the very few composers where, who, the, whose legacy will live, I think for hundreds, hundreds of years from now. Thank you. Very well stated. So I think we'll uh, sign off with okay, that. Go ahead, uh, <laughs> hey, grazie, signore. Wow. Marcone. Thank you. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. Let's, let's do it again. Great. Thank you. Thank again. you. Yes. Bye. It's been a pleasure. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye bye.